So we are in session 25 today and in this session uh, we will uh, start looking into the creating XSD and validating an XML in Visual Studio 2010 uh, IDE and uh, creating an XML document using XML writer and create, reading an XML document uh, using uh, XML reader and creating on reading uh, XML document using uh, XML document object uh, and uh, transforming the XML elements to a person object which is our uh, DOM object uh, plain old C sharp code objects of person and binding the collection to the data grid view so we will be using a, a generic list of persons as a data source and bind it to the data grid view we'll see that and also, yeah, this is another case uh, wherein we will use a generic list of persons as a data source and bind it to the data grid view and uh, manage the uh, data within it. And they will see a bookmarks, uh, uh, Visual Studio 2010 features. It's not specific to 2010, but we will be walking through the 2010 features, uh, one of the debugging features, such as the bookmarks uh, and how can we use it. Uh, and the enum.parse to transform an enum value to an enum type. Uh, this is a very interesting and useful um, feature. We will be looking into that. And continue with the X document overview. We will be looking into the X document versus the XML document and uh, uh, XML reader in a, uh, in next session. But in this session, we'll have a quick overview of what's an X document uh, to manage the XML documents. Okay, and We'll implement an observer pattern using a file system watcher, which is an out-of-box uh, uh, control to, uh, to, to listen to a given folder path and uh, detect any changes happening on the given XML file and refresh the changes onto your form UI uh, using uh, binding the data to the data grid view control. So this is a very interesting one. We'll take a look at this. Uh, at runtime and in another exercise to make the button blinking effect uh, using a timer control this is another very interesting one and also we'll see a text box autocomplete feature uh, and uh, to, ma to manage uh, how the file system uh, can be uh, looked into uh, using an XM, uh, text box autocomplete feature and the timer control we will see in context with the uh, button blinking effect and also an overview of uh, its click event, how we handle that and what we can do with that. And another exercise for uh, developing a, a web browser application uh, uh, using a few clicks and using an out-of-box web browser control and, a and the text box control and the the autocomplete feature to map the URLs to browse through it and that's another very uh, utility kind of a tool which we can uh, do with few minutes of coding. We'll see that and also we'll finally look into the uh, using link to query the collections and binding the result set to the data grid view implementing a searchable uh, form so that you can uh, accept the user search criteria from the form elements and Filter the filter the data on the uh, on the data grid view, and uh, show it uh, to the user. So it's a pretty much a search implementation. And lastly, we will also get into the app domain and current domain overview. What does it stand for? How can we use it? Okay, so let's roll off for session twenty-five. Okay, so we're going to continue system dot um, uh, XSD and validating XML in Visual Studio. Yeah, we have just um, I just demonstrated how to create an XSD, right? So we are clear. It's a pretty uh, straightforward to create an XSD, wherein I just have to go to XML and say create schema. Okay, and in this case, uh, since this is already created, created to which path? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure where it is created actually open containing folder or oh, it's actually created in somewhere in the temp folder um, I should have actually created it somewhere uh, here so that uh, I can see the XSD file but in this case uh, doesn't matter let it, let it be anywhere doesn't matter so I'm going to create again so how to validate this XML uh, using the given XSD 
uh, using IDE in other words okay we're going to make use of the IDE the Visual Studio IDE to do that work in other words if you're automating such kind of validations then you have xsd.exe tool that a command line tool that I showed you uh, that way you can uh, validate it using the command line and the easy way from the IDE is this way but of course most of the cases you might not do uh, using the way we are doing an IDE uh, you will do programmatically so we'll see the programmatically how we can do that as well and in this case uh, we'll make uh, use of the IDE so how do I do that I'll go to the same XML and the schemas and if you see by default since I have created that XSD it already picked to use the given XSD okay what I'll do is I'll get rid of this do not use the schema so it doesn't use any schema that means the XML document that I'm having is not going to use any schema so in this case I will tamper this I'll do what is uh, because it, the XSD says that uh, if I take a look at the XSD it has a definition that the children okay so person has a children and children has something called ID now I will get rid of this ID. I will, I will tamper and see the children don't have ID but instead I have ID N. Okay, and also I will uh, I will take another person also ID N. Okay, I see any any error with this? I'll save this document. So no issues, right? It's perfectly fine. Now I'm going to enable the XSD. I simply say use this schema and say okay. So immediately I see the errors. In other words, the whenever something happens in the uh, XSD validation, then it's going to show up like this. But ideally, it treat, it treats as a warnings, but not an uh, error because normally errors will come into play only when it is a code and a code execution. Uh, otherwise, the XML documents, all these kind of uh, messages will go into a warning because. Uh, there's nothing that you're running here. It's just validating the file and giving you the warning attributes. Okay, so this is how. Of course, now you will see that the attribute is not declared. That's the warning I'm getting. So, uh, and the required attribute ID is missing. So, I, I have to have it. So, it has a four set of errors because first thing is ID and is not a valid one. And I don't see ID because ID is supposed to be required field in my XST because as I mentioned, the ID is required. Okay, so two-way fold, two-fold validation happened. Now to fix that, of course, I have to go back and apply my fix and save it. And now it, it is fine. So that's how you can actually create an XSD and validate XSD inside a Visual Studio. Okay. And creating XML documents using the XML, uh, XML writer. So now we'll jump into the real core programming wherein we're going to make use of the system.xml um, namespace to create XML documents. So in this case I have, um, so I'll let me recap on what is the checklist I have here. So we're going to create an XML document using the XML writer. So there are multiple ways actually you can actually play with XML documents and in this case uh, that's why I want to make sure I walk through the checklist that I have so that I don't miss anything and overlap things here and there. So in this example I have which make use of the XML reader and writer. Okay and in this case first we'll run the code and then we'll come back to the code. And in this case, XML uh, re writer and reader. In this demo, what I have here is uh, create some data. Okay, so I just have some data created. Okay, I can do a next slide also. And uh, what I'm to write to XML file. Okay, so this is the one item, line item I have. Another one is the um, load data from XML. So. I know where this is going to write because uh, since I have uh, given a path uh, to write it to a uh, output file, since uh, the the uh, the default path, if you specify, the default path is always going to be the path where the application is running, and that's why it is going to come into my uh, debug dot print because in my IDE the file is going to run in this folder. Okay. Right now, so I have a content here on my page. And I'm going to, oops, okay. 
I'm going to hit right probably I want to see a side-by-side -side window so that um, I see the file is getting created so right to file so do I see a file created yes I see a file created here and uh, I, I'm opening this XML file so this is this is a file that's created out of my code okay and we'll have a close um, a mix and match with this content of the file uh, which is 100 to 107 uh, and I see the ID name and everything all this is pretty neatly written to my uh, flat file which is perfectly fine right another thing I want to demonstrate with this code is loading the content from the from this file okay what I'll do is I'll go and edit this uh, content. I'll uh, just change my name to Aripaka. This I'm completely doing on a flat file and save this file. Okay. And now I'll hit, uh, let me keep this on a side track here. Okay. And I hit load the XML file. And I see the change in my name reflected in my IDE. So I'm doing uh, both the directions, right? I'm writing my uh, data on the form to an XML file and also reading that file back to my application. So, so both both fold. And also, what I'm going to say is uh, write something here. Uh, I'll change the name completely. I'll say uh, something like uh, James Bond. I'll, I will not go with any such controversial names, but okay, it's James B. And uh, as Shah, and so on. So I just take a couple of uh, names, uh, like uh, the popular names that I know in this batch. Um, some names, right? Um, so fine, so that's all I need. So when I, once I do it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this file probably it might create because it might try to write the same file and say write to and I hope it's already written and uh, open this file and do I see the names yes I see the names that I've just written right so it's uh, both the way so this uh, grid control not only it shows the data it's also editable and what are data I'm, uh, I'm able to edit here I'm able, I'm able to write it to a flat file so if I do this way so do you really need a database for this no right so there's a very good chance that you might pick an XML as a one of your data store and it's it's not a joke but it's really a pro, in the real-time world uh, there are certain cases wherein you can write uh, a business data to an XML file and this is a very common scenario and people do ask uh, uh, or ask for such kind of uh, requirements in the real-time world. Uh, one of the very good examples that I can think of right away, uh, which I have done in my career, uh, is a requirement was um, to actually have a dynamic questionnaire. The questionnaire can be, uh, you have a standard template for the questionnaire that can be configured uh, and it can change and if you if you talk about the survey questionnaire you can imagine how the survey questionnaire looks like right uh, the first page has a predefined set of questions and based on the selection that the user picks from the first page uh, the second page questions will dynamically change based on the answers the user pick on the first page it's like that so it can be dynamic in nature and also the answers that the user picks you need to be stored into the database. So how do you design a system like that? Uh, it's a very complex uh, requirement if you think it because there is no standard way wherein you can actually uh, design the questions in such a way and also save the answers uh, whichever the uh, user is actually picking. So, so the options can be a wide variety of options. It could be a checkbox options or it could be a drop down option. It could be a plain text and so on. Um, so such kind of requirements, if you have a complicated requirements like that, then you can also as well go for a XML way wherein the user specific answers can be stored as a dynamic XML file like this. And uh, once the once user retrieves it, they can 
retrieve that XML file and show it on the screen. And of course, in their recent databases, not even recent database, pretty old uh, database even. In Oracle, if you take it, starts from 8i or 9i. Uh, the XML support is there in the database as well, wherein one of the column uh, data type can be an XML data store. AMC server also very well supports that kind of database. So if it is a line, line item, the record one of the column can be an XML document. Okay, so you can think of such scenarios. It's, it is a very valid and very useful scenarios that we are looking at and completely production uh, useful. And what all I did here, let's jump in, jump in here. So if I take a look at this code, uh, what I have here is a person, same popular person class that we have. It's not a dummy XML data, it's my business object data. I'm just actually adding a person list. And what is a person list right now? We'll jump in back to the person list first. My person list is a generic list. If I take a look at this, this is my system.collections.generic.list, which we discussed, right? And I have this generic list, which takes only persons. Remember, we did talk about uh, genetics in detail, um, and this one is an instance of that list of persons, right? And what I'm having in person, a person is my class, which is my business data, which is a plain class which has the same public properties, and it, ha it does have a constructor, a public constructor, and of course a default constructor. Okay, in, the, in this case, I'm actually making use of the public constructor, which is taking ID, name, age, and all the other ones as a parameters. Okay, I'm just making use of this person class inside my, when I hit the create button, where is my create button? Oops, I think I missed it. Okay, so inside my create data, I'm actually create in, in, uh, adding the various instances of my person objects into the list. And what I'm doing here, interestingly, is using my data grid view and data source. I'm just binding my collection to it. So this is very interesting, right? So my this is my custom class. This has nothing to do with the database data set. It's not a data table that I'm bringing in from a database. It's my customized list of uh, collection of persons, and I'm just binding that to my data source. Okay, so how can this understand my structure, right? So this is a very, very uh, useful feature wherein I can actually even uh, bind any collection to my data source. And that's the beauty of the uh, data source that we have here. So this is a control called uh, data grid view control, which comes from um, system.windows.forms data grid view control. And it has a property called data source. If I go back to my tools, you can also see this control. Sorry, I need to pin this here and then uh, walk through the data components here. And here's the control. So this is the data grid view control. I'm making use of it to get this done. And it's a very rich control. In uh, of course, this is again specific to our Windows forms. Okay, so what I'm doing here, um, let me go back to the source code, yes. And again, interestingly, so if this can take anything, so what is this made of? What is What type is this belong to? So take a look at this type that is taking. It's an object. So object, if you know it's the uh, it's a super class for all the ba of all the data types in .NET. So that means this data source can take literally anything, right? So even if I say some string, it's, it's going to take it, right? Will it take it? Let me quickly test it. Take this, okay? And I'll compile this. Any error? Oops, there is one error, which is grabbing for semicolon. Otherwise, no errors, right? My errors are zero. So imagine the beauty of this data source. But of course, if I run this, will that work? That's the question you should ask. Okay, so this is a very good test, obviously, as expected. Where is my, oh, I think this is the one, yeah. And create this, so it doesn't work. So it's actually ideally looks for a collection in general, 
so not specific to any value like this but the ideal looks for a collection and collection can be any collection it can be a generic collection or even an array list or array type anything so anything that has a collection it can actually take it and in this case that's what it's the beauty of this uh, property it take it is taking even my user defined list of persons and the person is completely my own definition and nothing to do with inside trading through the collection it is actually deriving the schema out of it and print uh, or displaying the data in this in the form and not only that we see more and we soon after I hit the refresh is actually displaying the data so that's what happening when I hit the load data right show data so that's what happening so this e control you can actually and make use I'm sorry this control you can actually use directly if you get any data from a database bind the data grid to it so it can take pretty much take the data set that coming from the database and bind it to it it's pretty easy you don't have to do any transformation logics uh, that you can think of that's number one so number two we already see that um, I'll demo that again so I see that if I change these values here, okay, let me go back to my browser or oh, go back to this, uh, it's not this, the debug location. Let me delete this, okay, and say write to file and it would write the file content there and I see the data getting updated here, okay. So it's not only listing the data, but also it is, uh, again, hang on, let me do the other way around. So since it is, okay, it reflected, now save it, load the data here. So not only this grid is enabling you to show the data, but also it is doing a predictable grid. So how this is happening? It's because I did not actually do any editing logic there. It's just loading the data from the from the source that I have attached to it, which is my collection. And whatever changes I'm doing to the list is actually reflected to my person's list because I'm actually saving when I hit the save to file. What I'm doing? Let me see that right to the file. When I'm doing this what I'm doing here is XML writer. I'm making use of an XML writer and uh, the root document is the start element is a person. So this is the root document. Oops, let me get rid of this tool tip. Yeah. yeah, what I'm doing here is creating my root element and then iterating through my person list. Take, take a close look at this. This is, I'm iterating through the person list not to my grid view uh, control dot data source okay the this is the variable that I actually uh, created uh, that I bound to my source where is the source I'm actually jumping here and there yeah so this is the con uh, local variable it's not actually local this is a class level variable it's declared uh, at the top which is available throughout my class okay and uh, that's the same variable that I bound to my uh, grid and I'm modifying the content on the grid and hitting the save. Where is my save? Yeah, this is the save. So I'm writing this content from that uh, control to the flat file. So what happening here is the changes that I'm doing on the grid is directly reflected to the data source which is my local variable. Okay. This is the typical behavior of a mutability. If you remember, there's reference types. The reference types behave the way uh, like a mut mutable. So if the, the data source, when I attach it uh, to my grid control, it's actually referring to the address, but where is this? Yeah. So when I attached, uh, when I bound this one data source, it's actually referring to the address of this person list. Okay, not the person. It's not copying, but it's referring to the respective address. That's the reason the changes, whatever I'm doing here, is actually reflected in the list also. So this is a typical behavior of a reference type data types. So that's the key thing to remember. And we are actually looking at the language basics in the real time examples. And what I'm doing here is iterating through each of these elements because I know this list is a types 
uh, type safe list which takes only persons and this is how it this is how type safety really makes uh, useful and person p in in this list and write person to xml writer and the implementation within this uh, my private member is actually right iterating through the respective element in this case person is an object that's coming in and this is my xml writer coming in and i'm writing x using the xml writer to write the start element and adding the attributes using the write attribute string and of course these are kind of uh, hard coded values because i know this is what need to be there for the respect to xml to be valid and then passing the values that i'm receiving it as a string and making them as a two string and that's how it goes and this one is actually creating an element and that's why because this function i need to call repeatedly for each person i just made this as a separate uh, function okay makes sense and uh, once i do this i'll go back to here and write to xml you know what as you see now right now i'm actually having a difficulty in uh, navigating from this block of code to an, another block of code right so is there any help from visual studio to help me in this Yes, there is one. So wow, the help here is the bookmarks. I can actually, because I am actually primarily working in this code block, I can add a bookmark here, hit this, and if you see there's a bookmark added up to my current line of code, and now I'm actually jumping to the uh, another code block. It could be within the same file or any other file, and I'll add another bookmark here, Okay, good. And I uh, will also add another bookmark. This is just a tip, okay? And um, because I wanted to make use of this code also, I will add another bookmark here, okay? So now I have totally three bookmarks, right? As a different uh, lines of code in my same file. Now to navigate from one or the other, I just have to use the, the navigation of a bookmark navigation buttons here, which is the next, previous, and so on. I'll go to hit the next one and it takes me directly there and previous it takes me there it helps right so this is a, just a tip how to make use of the ID feature uh, in such cases good so we able to transform the uh, the person object into the XML element and we are iterating through the all the elements and writing that element to the root node called persons and finally we are flushing it off and closing and this is the writing logic goes in okay and what I'm doing for reading the content load data from XML so this in first thing I'm doing is I'm clearing my local variable which is a person list then imagine everything I'm doing is with this person list only nothing else because this is my data source okay and in this case I'm making use of the file stream to load the respective person XML imagine I was talking about the default path since I did not give any relative path since I made it as a person XML it always refers to the uh, the application path where the EX is running since my ID my EX is running from my debug folder that's the reason it's actually writing that file into this path okay so down the line if you really want to make a relative path then you can make use of the uh, application domain dot uh, yeah, this is how you should be actually making use of it which I actually have another example example where I'm actually making use of it wherein you're going to use for application domain app domain in other words we'll see that we don't want to jump from this topic to another topic okay and this is where we are using the file stream XML uh, file and uh, making use of the uh, XML reader to read the file in this case uh, we are reading the uh, FS which is my file stream and this is my person XML okay and this file mode is open and uh, while read so as long as this uh, read statement is true we're going to loop through this and then uh, check if the respect to uh, node is an XML element and then and it has an attributes again so all elements need not have an attribute so these are the checks we are doing so all this information is available through my XML reader okay I check for the node type attributes and then use that XML reader element uh, to transform that XML element to my person list 
That means this person is, you know, this is taking only the uh, person class. So what I'm doing here is this call is going to transform Okay, so this call is actually taking an XML reader, XR, that is respective element, and what it is doing is, it's actually creating an instance of person and populating the person object uh, with respect to values like ID, name, sex, age, and all the things, and then finally returning the P. Okay, and this line of statement, you will be interested to you. In this case, so what I have here is the enum conversion. In this case, country, if I go to my nationality here, right click and go to, I made my uh, nationality as a enum. Okay, if this is a country, is not a system defined data type, it's my user defined data type, which is an enum. We did talk about the enum, right? So in this case, I'm actually initializing with 0, 10, uh, 11 and 12 so these are the values that are available um, and I am making use of this when I'm creating the again I'll make use of this yeah here you go I'm making use of that uh, enum when I'm actually populating it because that person country attribute is a enum this is the same example as if a master data or a referential integrity that you apply in a database so that user picks only the value that's available within the list Okay, and how I'm going to try re retrieve the same thing out of the XML. So that's what I'm trying to do the, in the other sample. Uh, I did not have a breakpoint to the other location. So now again, I have a problem. So I have to go back from read here. Okay, good. So I'll come back here and yes, probably I'll add another bookmark here just in case and go to the definition of this part so this is the this is how i am actually transforming the respective attribute value to the enum value okay so this is an interesting code um, so it's a type of country we are just passing using the enum has a static member called parse and this parse is actually uh, passing the respective attribute value this could be uh, just a plain string okay and transforming that into the country type of country and once I get that output it, it's going to be an object and that object is uh, typecasted to country so that I get uh, the uh, the string value in the database uh, okay let's let us take a look at what is the value it's been writing to Oops. okay so it's actually writing the whole name Okay, it's not actually the uh, the numeric portion of the enum. Okay, so how it is writing to? So when I, what is it I'm doing and when I'm writing to? So usually, okay. So let me go back. I hope I have a bookmark there. Yes, yeah, so when I'm when I'm writing that attribute out, I'm actually doing a person dot nationality dot two string. When I do two string, I'm getting the in uh, the full name part of my enum. This is a very good example actually, usually I have seen people, the, what they do for such kind of transformation, they usually iterate uh, like an if and else uh, statement. Let me go back. Okay, what I was telling is, uh, I, have seen, I have seen people who normally, uh, they don't know this uh, static member available in the enum that you can make use of it to pass what they ideally do is they check for this value and they will uh, do a switch case if this case is uh, say for example India Africa and so and then initialize the local enum value and then return it that's how they people normally do actually for whoever they don't know there is a shortcut available like this okay so this is a very good tip uh, to transform an enum to a given uh, create a, the value back as an enum so that's what we are doing here so get the so this block is uh, transforming the XML reader to the respective person so vice versa we were actually doing for the same object and then we bind it to the uh, grid I think another one we already have yeah sorry yeah so we're adding to the person list perfect so that's what we did uh, vice versa and again finally at this point we're actually binding that person list to the data source so we are just using the data source uh, this control 
just as a view. It does nothing than just to display the content in that given local variable and take it. So everything else is done using my own list of person. Okay, hope uh, this uh, is clear enough and it's going to be very very useful. And we did, okay yeah, so we did not, we did use the XML writer to create the same document. Now we're going to make use of the XML document. Okay. So this is another example called XML document which is similar to this but I have little more additions to it but we'll see the same example that we have done so far and uh, then go back to the rest of the other items. And in this case it's the same thing. I'm going to go with the XML document route and maximize this and in this case we see the path. The path is already populated here because I'm actually making use, use of the app domain uh, to retrieve the uh, let me go back. Oops. Okay, I can actually go this way also. Uh, hit F04 to see the format, uh, sorry, the form properties. And I hit the events, but events, uh, hope you see this uh, thunderstorm icon. This represents the events of the given form. And of course, this represents the properties. If at all you want to see the events uh, of this form, then you have to go this route. And I have a event handler associated to my load event. So all these are various events for the form which you can actually explore and see what are the events this form is having. And I made use of only one event called the load and it, this has an event handler. If I double click, excuse me. And now what I see here is the application domain dot current domain dot base directory. So this this is the this will give me the path where this application is running, and that's what I'm taking to my uh, watch directory. Okay, makes sense. How I got that uh, whole path? It's not hard coded. It's dynamic in nature. So down the line, if I deploy this to a different location, then I'll see the location where this exe is running. Perfect. Now. Here I have the same set of data. Of course, it's different uh, class altogether and different data elements altogether. And I'm going to hit the same write to file. In this case, it's going to write to a different file name altogether. I don't want to overlap the old one. Okay, so take a watch on the right hand side and I'll see the write to file and successfully created a file for me. And I'm going to open this in the browser. And I see the file, it's the same content, it's written out and there's nothing new to it. It's the same output that I normally see with the same way I did with the XML reader. And at the same time, again, I'm going to again do the same exercise. Uh, open this uh, file, edit the content, save the file, and here I'll say load. So it's good. So I see my data is getting reflected here. Perfect, and uh, have a clear again, which is clearing the grid, um, which is going to clear off. And I demonstrate right now, uh, loading the data, write to a file, uh, uh, write to a file, and the load data from XML. In this case, it's actually loading the data from my business objects. So we'll walk through the code how the same example is done using my XML document. Okay, so there is another way uh, to create documents which is called X document. The X document, uh, for example, like just give me a second, uh, try to put X document. There's another uh, way to do is an X document which is uh, pretty much make use of the XML uh, link, link to XML uh, which using which also you can do uh, play with the XML documents which is a more recent one which falls in the system dot uh, I think it's a link namespace, it falls with the links namespace. Otherwise XML document you can also make use of it. XML document using this you can actually have an XPath queries wherein you can filter the data as well. Uh, this is a little richer than just plain XML reader and writer. Okay. And yes, what we are doing here in this XML. Okay, so we in this case uh, create some data. So I'm going to uh, better delete all my old bookmarks okay and so that I start with a fresh one this time I'll 
pretty much will make sure I have a bookmark created for every time and it's the same list here I'm actually making use of uh, same person list in this case I have a uh, class level variable and uh, which uh, I'm just uh, making use of it to populate the respective class uh, and bind the data. It's the same thing which is data grid view. Our focus is not with the grid control, it's more with the XML writing, right? And once I, uh, this is how I'm populating the data. And now comes the write to a file. In this case, I'll add a bookmark here again, just in case if I have to go back to the same piece of code. And in this case, what I'm doing, so I'm doing making a call of an XML document and uh, I'm creating create XML declaration. This is the first line if you remember I was talking about that declaration need to be there if at all you are actually creating a document. Did I able to create that declaration with my old approach? I'll actually open this code. So if you see the declaration is already created even if I did not specify it from a code. So this is important that uh, your program does okay and in real world examples you might have something called XML NS which stands for XML namespace which I did not actually showed you um, how does an XML NS looks like let me open uh, this document here and go and see the source because this is an XHTML uh, document this will have this should definitely have XML NS uh, tag somewhere. Yeah, here you go. So this is a namespace that we're talking about XML NS, and uh, if you see, it refers to the a uh, URL which is w3 org 9999 and XHTML. This stands for the uh, as a namespace uh, that's going to be used for this document, and this will make your document elements unique. Uh, for your doc, for your content, so it's important for uh, for production uh, ready code to have an XML NS. Uh, this is the namespace for XML document in simple. Okay, so, so those things you can actually uh, there is more to it, and whatever we are seeing today in this example is a plain vanilla flavor, which is uh, uh, a simple example in other words. And if you down the line, if you see, we'll see a lot of more. Uh, complications to it, uh, just like an XML NS is one other thing you which you might have to add to each and every node in the writing. Again, it's not that scary topic. Again, it's uh, not that uh, uh, you can actually ha have a constant in your local and add XML NS to your document. It's pretty simple, but it's just uh, important that um, the point I'm trying to tell you is there is more than what you're seeing today. We are just walking through the surface of it. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to and uh, refer to. Okay, so this is the where we are declaration part is done and uh, we're just adding the append the child, the XML node document. Uh, once it has a uh, first thing item, the first item is added here and then comes the the element, the first element, which is my root element. Okay, and I create that uh, root element and again I call the document append child and then I iterate through my uh, list of persons and adding append child again. So append child, append child, append child is the call that you're going to make to add the respective element and in this case since the persons is my root node that's what is declared as a XML node this is my instance and I'm actually creating an element and I'm making use of uh, uh, this XML node hereafter so that's all the, all the other elements I'm actually adding to my XML node okay that's the important thing here and all the children because all these other children persons will come under my persons node just so I'm actually uh, handling the uh, the, uh, the hierarchy in which the uh, the elements fall under and finally we are passing the uh, calling the doc.save and passing the file name okay file name in this case it's just a constant um, in this case uh, let me see what's the value here so this is a constant uh, file name that we see that file name got created uh, in the directory. Okay, if I want to change this file name to be something else, then I have to change it here. Makes sense? And we can make use of uh, this here. So we able to uh, do this on the save button. So pretty simple. So you have to just iterate through each and every element and then save it. And next one is the load document. And I'll add a breakpoint again here, just to be sure. 
and this is again it fits it doesn't you know if you see I can see the whole function within just once um, within one screen I don't have to actually scroll that's a line of code I'm actually having to write to and going forward this is the best practice to keep your code in concise so that uh, your function is viewable in in one screen so that I, I don't have to scroll down uh, this principle is again way back the very old principle called the KISS principle don't mislead uh, don't mistake by that word but K-I-S-S -S, uh, in other words stands for keep it simple stupid so this is, this is, uh, this is one of the very old principle which I still remember there are a ton of principles of course uh, with this principle pretty much talks about uh, how concise the code needs to look like uh, in, in as a thumb rule if you can see the whole function in one screen that means your your function is good to go so in this case I might I even write I can able to even write this same logic within my for each again so that's also fine doable one thing is it's will that be reusable no it, it will not be reusable if I want to reuse the same thing somewhere else so that's the reason so wherever code blocks that you can make reuse it's always a good practice to move that code into a different method and make use of it and at the bottom line is try to see that your function doesn't go beyond your one screen okay that's the kind of a, one of the best practice I would like to recommend and once you have this element in this case we are actually reading the file and we know the file name which is a constant and we're creating XML document here and we're just loading the XML reader so first, first thing is the reader we have when uh, reader is required for you to read into an XML document okay so XML reader we did and uh, this is the text reader XML text reader we are just passing the file name because this file name by default it implicitly means that it is the file is available within the application root where the application is running okay it's picking that file and we create the XML document here and XML document dot load the reader so using the reader it's going to load the content into XML document and once this is uh, read and we are soon after that we are actually closing the reader okay uh, once you load it we don't have to keep the reader open because if you keep it open then the the file will be locked till you save it okay till you close it actually so in this case once I load it into my XML document doc, the document is now in my memory inside my XML document not linked to the document on the file on the on the file system once I have this document I just have to iterate through it and use the same logic wherein I'm iterating through the XML each XML element inside my element which is get by tag name so this is the key thing here this is the get by tag name the same thing you can also use uh, using the XPath queries uh, I'm not actually covering the XPath queries in my session but uh, it's open to you once you have the XML document uh, loaded with the data you can use the XPath queries to filter the data within it and uh, in uh, X document you can actually make use of the linked queries and lambda expressions to filter through the uh, the content which is almost like we saw the lambda expression so we can make use of it to uh, filter data and it's pretty much like where clause select and everything so you can use the link on X documents as well so that's where the X document comes into play and in my today I would want to show you one of the example of a link using which how we can filter the data okay I'll show you that example okay coming back to this topic here and we are just transforming the XML element which is EX here into a person and then adding it to it and hope you already know what kind of uh, code will be inside my transformation adding a bookmark again so it's the same XML element this is an XML element and then re creating a person populating my person with the respective attributes and the same enum parsing here and then returning the P here which is straight away straightforward so that's the same logic only thing is the different uh, uh, class libraries we made use to do it in different ways perfect so now that's taken care so I hope you understood how we made use of the XML writer as well as XML document to manage the XML files perfect as so what's the next we have uh, of course we did also see the data grid view uh, which uh, using which we actually bind the generics list as a data source we did see the pers list of persons right that's taken care and we also took care of the XML reader 
and we just walk through how we can read the XML file and bind it to the grid and also the XML document for reading the XML document we also covered that just now and here comes the very interesting one and uh, yeah we did actually make use of the uh, file system washer control in the last uh, session and uh, to monitor the respective file path to see if the any files got changed right so I'm actually making use of the same control to implement a very interesting fact here okay two things what I'm trying to do here is uh, using XML document okay debug path perfect and what I'm trying to do here is uh, in uh, design patterns, uh, this pattern you can you, you is referred to as an uh, as an observer pattern. An observer pattern, what it does is it actually looks for it actually listens to the uh, the end data source uh, constantly, and if there is any change in that data source, it's actually going to be pushed to the respective uh, subscriber. The same thing we did. Uh, refer to the web feeds. In other words, RSS or the Atom. Uh, uh, we can make use of to implement the uh, RSS feeds. What it does is the same pattern in which where actually once you subscribe to a given uh, resource file or a resource on a web, any changes or any content change on the given resource will be notified to the uh, to the uh, to the application which subscribed to it. Okay, so the same pattern we are actually making use of it with the XML. So what in this example I'm trying to do is I am creating a data here and also create uh, writing this to a file so now this content is actually on this file now what I'm trying to do here is uh, edit this content okay and say Aripaka some name and save this here and now uh, coming back here I'm seeing load then it's getting reflected now in this case what I want to do is I'm going to subscribe my application to listen to this file and see if there is any changes done to this file then reflect that changes automatically to my screen so I don't have to go back and say load right so that's an observer pattern implementation uh, which is again um, can be implemented uh, ideally technically uh, conceptually you can use the MVC as well whereas the controller uh, not not control. So the model will actually have an observer pattern implemented on the data, uh, which is called your model. The model and the view. Whenever there is any change in the model, that change will be reflected back to the view automatically. So this is the same pattern implementation using my uh, file observer. Okay, or the, the file watcher. What I'm going to do here in this case. Okay, close this. To do that, I have a watch button implemented here. Uh, this watch button, we'll see what it's going to do and how it is going to uh, take care of the, the observer pattern. Once I hit this watch, now it says it's watching. It's watching to this file because we know that the content of, uh, of course, this form, they using the constant, we're actually referring to this file only. And I'm going to edit this file now. And I'm going to take a close look at the content on my grid uh, soon after I save this file. Okay keep your eye on both the sides I change this file and I hit save so immediately if I see I see the change applied back here okay so this is that my application is actually listening um, not to the file but yeah of course it's listening to this file uh, if there is any change happening on this file it's immediately reflecting in this case I'll say I'll give a couple of names okay Okay, and uh, yeah, I think Hawaii Power is there already. Okay, I think pretty good um, for now. So hit save, and I see the names getting reflected here. And not only that, if I uh, change uh, any of the other attributes, like the 35, I'll say, I'll say 15, or I'll say 20. So any change in my file, so it will reflect. So how cool is that? And I'll stop watching. And now I'll do any changes. Now it doesn't reflect because I'm stopped watching to it. So it's this is a 
just an implementation of subscribe and unsubscribe. Now I am unsubscribe it, so nothing will happen, and subscribe it because it once I do subscribe it, any changes after my subscription, then only it will be firing, right? And now I'll save it. Oh, now the exception again. So that's fine. Uh, we normally have exceptions because uh, it's not a production ready code, but hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, again, we'll run the same thing again. So this is just a demo code. It's not a production ready code. Okay. So exceptions are anticipated. Okay. Create the data, and now I'll say watch, and Okay, so I just change this, hit save, and now I see the um, changes reflected back to my screen. So this is a typical implementation of an observer pattern. So now we're going to walk and see two things. Number one, how this uh, mechanism is working, and number two is how this blinking is working. Okay, if you observe it carefully, it's a blink yellow background and something is happening, it's notifying that something is really working and uh, stop watching, uh, it's text is changed and so on. So I have uh, interesting mechanism that I have written there, I just want to walk you through that and uh, it's going to be not too long, it's going to be pretty simple. Okay, so now we'll get into the watch. Now in this case, if you take a look at this, I have my file system watcher and a timer. These are the two controls I'm making use of it. Uh, first, we'll uh, make use of uh, walk through the file system watcher. We did actually see this control last time, and uh, I'm taking a look at the properties. What I have here is uh, notify filter. This is one key thing you want to may take a look at this. So, so whichever action item that I pick from this then that respect to item will be notified to me. So in this case, uh, if there is anything change in the attribute, size, or uh, last write access, so on, uh, things will be notified. Oh, hang on. Yeah, so I just picked all those respective uh, line items, whichever get changed. Uh, and that will be notified to me and within this I have an event handler whenever there is a change and there are other event handlers so there are a couple of event handlers for my file system watcher which is called created deleted and renamed okay in this case I just subscribe to only the changed event uh, the other ones is if I add any new files then this event will fire event handler I need to handle that event handler to see if there are any new files coming in Okay, so that's a very interesting one. If at all you want to implement implement any application wherein the the feeds are coming from external system, they drop a file to a given file uh, folder, and you your application need to keep on watching to. It's not again not that expensive. That it's it's, it's not kind of a, a runtime uh, service that need to be running on. It's just a, a watcher on a given file system. If anything happens, then the Windows uh, event will fire up, and that event is going to be. Uh, bubbled up back to you application. So that's what it's going to work. It's not going to give you any uh, hard uh, performance hits. In generally, if you write any uh, listeners like this, then you might use a timer control or a, a service uh, that you can host on a given Windows service, which will keep on running at a given time. And you know, it's not that route. It's a very simple route. This event, uh, the file system washer, watcher is actually going to look into the the Windows. Uh, events that are going to be raised and based on the events that are raised in the events of, uh, in the uh, Windows file system of, uh, from the operating system, it's going to bubble up that event uh, using these events. So it's not going to be that expensive to you. And uh, whenever a file got deleted, this event will bubble up and also whenever the file is renamed, so on. So in this case, I just picked only the change event and what I did here is nothing but just a button click. I'm just calling the event handler of a button click and uh, this is the same call that I'm going to be uh, calling when I hit the, which one? Uh, I think it is uh, when I hit the watch. Yeah. No, no, not this one. I think I have another button, load from XML. Yeah, this is the load from XML. I'm actually calling the routine, uh, same routine to load from XML. 
just the reason you need to actually give a proper name otherwise you will really get lost uh, since it's a demo I'm just taking care of it lightly but in production code it always important to give a proper name to your controls and your methods otherwise we will not know what we are writing for and in this case what it's doing the same thing with that we already walked through is opening the respective file and refreshing my UI okay so that's exactly what I'm doing. It's a one line of code that I have on my file system watcher event handler. handler. And it has a couple of other properties called the enable raising events. By default this is set to true and when I, whenever I hit the uh, subscription or it means watch and stop watch, I'm actually disabling or enabling from, pro, from my code. That's what I'm doing actually. And uh, that's what goes into my watch button. In my watch button, I'm checking, it's like a toggle button, wherein first when it is a watch, if the text is watch, then when I'm doing something that's going to st uh, start off, kick off my enable, the timer is enable, we'll get into the timer after this, um, and the button watch text uh, is changed to stop watching, and uh, the file system watcher properties I have updated here. And one of the thing is uh, the raising events is true. And of course the filter is my file name. I'm listening only to the file name that I have in my file name constant which is my uh, this file, right? You already know this is the file name that we are watching. And the constant name again if you just forgot, this is the file name we are watching. Okay. Oh, again I'm lost. Okay, go back here. Yep. So that's what we are doing when it is a watch. Perfect. And soon after that, if it is now, once it is done for, once you hit this for the first time, the label is going to change to stop watching. And if the uh, next time if you hit, the, it will come into the else part if it is a stop watching. It's a kind of a code I have written. It's not like out of box. Uh, when it is stop watching, then we are enabling, uh, disabling this uh, file system watcher and resetting the text back to watch and of course I'm just changing the color to original color. So we'll then come back to the timer. So we understood how the subscription is happening, how the refresh is happening, right? So straightforward using the file system watcher. And now the blinking effect, how the blinking effect is taken care of? That's using my timer control. So timer is uh, again a built-in control which is available out of shelf uh, which will have a couple of interesting properties, very simple properties. One is of course enable or true or false. By default it is false so that it's not going to uh, run every time. And the interval you can set it here and the interval that you specify here is a milliseconds. So in this case I'm actually giving one tenth of a second otherwise a 1000 milliseconds becomes one second, right? That's how the interval is going to be and I set to one tenth of a second and it has an event called only one event which is called tick. So that what it does is for every interval in this case one tenth of a second this is going to raise that event and we just have to implement the uh, event handler. We just have to handle that event. In this case I'm simply checking if the button watch has a stopwatch that means the first time you hit the button I'm just playing with the color here. I'm just uh, uh, swapping the color if this is an original color I just saved the color originally in the load event and I'm using that color to map if this original color then change it to some blink color uh, the color uh, is a local variable here which I have declared as a drawing dot color object and the first one is a uh, the the blink color is a yellow that's what I pick if I want to change it I can pick it here okay so if just give me a second because I have to go back again Good. So that's what I'm doing. It's just a toggle effect between if the if the color is old one, then change it to the blink one. Otherwise, again, if it is blink one, then change it to old one. So what happens here? For every one tenth of a second, this event is going to be fired, and that's when I am actually changing the uh, swapping the colors from one or the other, and that's how we see that blink effect. Okay. So this is how the blink effect is coming up. Interesting. Yeah, so you can play around with that timer control. It's a very interesting one and uh, really uh, fun to make. You can um, play with it. And that's about the file system watcher using the observer pattern. And uh, yes, another important thing with the file system is the auto 
complete behavior. We did not actually pay a little close attention to that uh, part here. Uh, probably, do we have this here? I'm trying to key in something here. Probably this is not the control I used. I'll probably use somewhere else. Where did I use it? Probably file search. Did I? Yeah. So in this con uh, in this example, I actually made use of the autofill feature. Uh, where and if you see the, I actually bound uh, the data source of my file system altogether. So in this case, if you see my help, it is just like my. Uh, you can visualize. So this is actually listing my whole file system inside my control. So there is a predefined set of properties that you can actually set it here, uh, which you can make use of it. This is a very quick example. So this text box, uh, the properties are under behavior. If I can group it on the category or appearance wise, then I can see these two property is called autocomplete custom source. Now in this case custom source, I'm not having custom source, otherwise you can have a custom source as well. And uh, in this case, uh, this is an autocomplete mode and autocomplete source. Okay, autocomplete mode I picked to have suggested. Uh, in other words, I can also have append and append suggest. It's going to just add to it. Uh, by default, it's going to be none. Okay, and uh, the source is a big list of source I have here. I have a file system, in this case, uh, file system directories, and all system sources, all URLs, and so on. And uh, just a quick demo with all URLs. What what you'll see with all URLs if I make it. If at all you want to build a web browser application, then that's what you normally would like to go. Wherein you'll see my uh, the all the URLs that I have browsed recently. This is from my browsing history. Okay, this is just very interesting um, one which you can actually make use of it. If term time permits, I can actually demonstrate a how to develop a uh, web browser of your own. If you take a look at the Chrome. Um, you can actually bring in your own web browser. Chrome is, well, again, we'll not get into too much of uh, like logical uh, how complex the algorithm is written for the given browser. In using Windows, if I really you want to create a um, web browser, we can actually create one. Okay, I hope I can actually demonstrate in just two minutes. It's not that complicated to do. I hope we have little time. Uh, in this case, I'm going to just add a new item. I'll just add a web form. I'll say my web browser. Okay. So I'm going to make use of a two simple controls here. Out of shelf with my toolbox. Okay. So one obviously, obviously is going to be my text box. Where is my text box? Up here. You can actually do this and make use of it as a real-time um, browser in your day-to-day -day life. It really works perfectly. No issues. Okay, I'll take this as suggest and complete auto with my all URLs. Which is going to be just like my web URL. Okay, and of course I need to have a button to say go to. Oh, where is my click button? Yep, add this button control. And uh, this is going to say go. Okay, so I, I will not uh, change any names there, but I'll just put this go. And another interesting control is my web browser. So this is an out of shelf control. You can just drag and drop and place it here. So we will not take care of the resizing and other things, but we'll just keep this as is. And inside my browser control, I'll say this dot uh, web browser one dot navigate to, oops, navigate, it's going to take a uh, yeah, string, which is going to be this dot my text box one dot text. That's one line of code I need and uh, once I do that 
I have to of course uh, make this as my startup project okay otherwise uh, I don't want to go with the route of adding a button other things I will instead I will make a shortcut here wherein I will add this uh, here so that this becomes my uh, startup form okay in this case I'll say my browser yep that's all I need and now run this code and I have my browser ready wherein I'll say my google.com oh hang on I will probably take another one uh, which is uh, wikipedia.org okay and hit go and now I see my browser is ready so this is just like uh, a normal browser it just works like uh, just pick any other language uh, in Wikipedia of course it, this is the same error from uh, I will say no from the respective uh, browser so it works just like a browser you can create your own so this doesn't have any ads uh, or any tools and other things it will explain your own browser control which you can make use of it sounds simple it's very easy it's just uh, out of shelf we have a couple of controls that you can make use of it and your web browser is ready to use. You can also have a tab based um, navigation. You can also make use of the uh, tab control. Where is the container controls? Probably container, containers. Yep. Okay, here you go. Containers. And within this, you have a tab control, uh, which you which you can add it to your form and make it as a tabbed browsing, the way we have in Internet Explorer uh, uh, 8 onwards. A tab browsing you can do like this. Sounds simple. So you can actually do that. It's pretty pretty simple and uh, very fun. And timer we did make use of it. And uh, the last one is the link. Okay. So the last one is a very simple one. I just want to demonstrate how we can make use of a link to filter the content. Okay. In this case as usual I'll go with the demo first uh, yeah with XML document I have this link and uh, here I just loaded data so if I want to do a filtering on this data it's a simple like your search screen okay uh, I'm going to filter in this case I have I think uh, by default I have a or algorithm here in which case I check for ID is 100 and age is greater than uh, say 30 so in this case I should not see any age which is 24 and not ID so link demo and I will to filter the data okay perfect and also if I change my filter criteria again 45 and link demo and I see which is ID of course 100 or age is greater than 45 so uh, I pick the first row which is ID matches uh, 100 and other other records having age which is greater than or equal to 45 the filter is working good perfect so the, how did I do this so once this I did based on my uh, collection so collection has applied my uh, link query how does the link query look like we'll just walk through that okay within this okay, link demo so this is just a single line of code I have as a query uh, in person list where ID is equal to the given ID which is my ID is actually retrieved from the uh, input box input ID and age I'm just take, uh, type casting it a respective data type and uh, because the the P, P is more type safe right the P ID is of in 32 and of course age is byte that's why I have to type cast the inputs that are coming in and uh, applying the filter with the same where clause it's a simple C sharp code if you see is equal to comparison operator and the or operator and greater than or equal to age in this case since I put the or I'm actually seeing either of this condition is true or both uh, if I just switch this to end operation okay so this is a, this is how we can actually do the end operation also an XML document maximize get data and uh, I'll say it, it should be uh, 100 
ID and also should be uh, 23 age because there's nothing like the 23 age here, right? So in this case, what will happen? I was expecting that it should match with the respective uh, both the case. Oh, it's greater than oh, it's greater than or equal to. Sorry, the condition is correct it's because it's greater than or equal to. That's why it matches because age uh, is greater than or equal to 35. And since this is great, yeah, it's perfect. So it's only that um, I thought something else. Um, so it works good and if I change this to something else then there should not be data or there is someone else with the same uh, 23 uh, which is fine uh, and I'll uh, create the data again and uh, do something that uh, will get me uh, okay without this and uh, with this will I have any data no so that's what I was trying to get to and I'll clear this completely and load it again because my clear will actually clear it. otherwise the load will actually keep on adding a duplicate records there and the I hope yes the end logic is working good and uh, A should be greater than or equal to uh, 23 let me see yeah there are so many oh there are repeated now so because I was hitting the create some data multiple times the local variable is actually populated with uh, redundant data so, so how this is how you can actually make use of the link queries and there is more to the link queries actually in this case as we see it's actually querying my object collection and it's returning the P within the query tree and again look at this beauty of my link query and the data source I'm just doing no transformation here I'm just binding my query and that means the query I'm actually running the tool list and binding to the data source directly. So this is the beauty of um, uh, the .NET. You don't have to really worry about who knows the what the query is going to return. In this case, the query is actually returning uh, the person collection only. Again, it's going to be a generic list. And in this case, we can actually take a look, close look at uh, this query actually. That will be a very interesting one. Even I would like to uh, see the format how this is going to be looking at, like. Uh, okay, we'll apply the same 100 and uh, some 20. Okay, in this case, if I put 40, will this work? I should not have any data. Okay, let me run this first and see. I'm eager to see if there's no data. So in this case, if it is 20, then we should have data. So just want to make sure my uh, logic is working or not. Okay, good. So it's now work. It's good. Now I'll get into this and uh, see this query and uh, take a quick watch and it's a link query its output is a link enumerable where list iterator and uh, it has the collection uh, and that's the reason we have the the variable defined for link as where because uh, we don't want to really know about what kind of return type you're going to get in this case based on the way since I have because I have where clause that's why it has enumerable enumerable dot where list iterator uh, otherwise I we know we have discussed only up to enumerable not further right so in this case it's more than that and of course the key thing here to know is that it's again type safe and it's a generic and it's a person because it's our own class uh, and that's what we are actually written from the select statement and this query has a result set and that's bound to as a to list here and once I run F10 and we see the data source it has count of only one and this is pretty good perfect I have this content as uh, data here it's a person object so that's what we're trying to go to it's still a person my my custom object in this session we did continue with creating XSD and validating the XML in Visual Studio 2010 and creating XML document uh, using uh, the uh, system.xml.xml writer and creating the XML documents using XML document and uh, creating uh, uh, a UI we're showing the data grid view control 
uh, on Windows Forms uh, and uh, binding a generic person list to it as a data source and we did see how uh, it seamlessly it can integrate uh, both the uh, modifying the data on the grid as well as uh, loading the content uh, directly to the grid with a very very simple code and uh, we did see also how to read an XML using the XML reader and also reading an XML using XML document uh, objects and we, we did also have some uh, quick overview of X document we will see an X document example in the next session uh, along with the comparison between the uh, XML reader versus XML document versus the X document in the next session uh, and this session we did actually do a very good uh, walkthrough on the code and uh, demo how we can use these uh, out of box XML objects to manage the XML documents and uh, another uh, key uh, exercise we did is uh, implementing the observer pattern using the file system watcher to refresh the uh, data grid view on the form uh, using the XML file changes or triggering the file changes on the file system and refreshing the grid uh, on the fly. Yes, text box we did use the, we did create a very good example of the uh, using the text box and the web browser. We did develop a My Web Browser app which can be, uh, be which can behave just like a, a web browser uh, and we did uh, make use of the autocomplete features to now use the uh, text box as a uh, URL mapping uh, and also we did demonstrate how can we use the file system as an autocomplete feature as well. So that was a very interesting demo. And we did see the timer control uh, in, as a uh, and implemented the blinking effect on the button control uh, uh, in context with the uh, the observer pattern implementation uh, using the file system watcher. And uh, yes, we did see a timer control. How can we use it? How can we set its interval and uh, handle its click event? And we did see lastly the link to query uh, the collection and the bind to the bind the result set to the data grid view control and uh, resulting in the form of a searchable uh, form wherein a uh, user can key in the search parameters and the underlying link query can apply to the underlying data source and filter the uh, data and um, uh, refresh the, uh, the UI on the uh, data on the UI using the data grid view control. So all this we have seen in this session and we'll continue with the next uh, session uh, remaining topics uh, in the XML such as the programmatic XST validation and other things in the next session.